Hello and welcome to our presentation on your journey through IVF treatment. The aim of this presentation is to give you the information regarding the clinical and lab processes and to prepare you for what to expect during your treatment. I'm Dr. Smriti Bhatta. I work in the center as a senior clinician. So what we'll cover in the presentation is initially to go with the background of what is it we, that we do differently in IVF compared to natural conception. Then I'll talk you through what happens during treatment, what happens in the lab, the lifestyle considerations, the clinic appointments that you'll have to attend, and the consent form that you'll have to sign. Finally, I'll give you some useful information, including the success rates. So to start with the background, I'll draw your attention to the first image, which is an image of the brain. And you can see it's a labeled small gland called the pituitary gland. This plays a key role in human reproduction and secretes the two key hormones called FSH and LH. These hormones in every monthly cycle signal the ovary to grow a single follicle which is an egg sac to grow one mature egg and release it. Compared to that, in IVF, what we do is to give you these hormones, either FSH alone or combine FSH and LH injections to grow multiple egg sacs or follicles in one cycle and therefore retrieve multiple eggs. Allowing with developing multiple eggs, we also have to keep your own natural hormones quiet and therefore you will be on a second injection to block your own pituitary hormones. There are four key steps of the IVF process. The first is collect is ovarian stimulation and retrieval of eggs. The second is fertilizing these eggs in the lab with a sperm sample. The third is to allow these fertilized eggs to grow and divide into embryos. And the fourth key step is to select the embryo which is suitable for transfer into your womb in the hope of achieving a pregnancy. So let me take you through these steps one by one and I'll start with the clinical aspects. So the first step is ovarian stimulation. So how do we do that? For, before starting the injections, we have to await a period. We cannot go with your natural period as a, this can create difficulty in scheduling as we're only allowed to do a certain number of procedures every week. Therefore, we advise you to have progesterone tablets, which when taken for a certain time, will induce an artificial bleed called the withdrawal bleed. You are on these tablets for a maximum of two weeks, and these contain the hormone progesterone. We give you a letter to obtain these tablets from your GP. Once we have started bleeding after withdrawing the tablets, we do an initial scan called the baseline scan and if all is well in that, we proceed with the injections. The first injection is the hormone injection FSH or a combined FSH LH injection that you start for developing the exacts. And the second hormone injection is to block your pituitary hormones. This could be either cetrorelix or bucerelin, which is started either before or after your stimulation injections. And the aim, as I mentioned, is to keep your own hormones quiet and prevent any ovulation or premature release of eggs before we are ready to retrieve them. Once the follicles are ready, we give you the final injection to begin the ovulatory process and promote egg maturation. While you're on the injections, you will need monitoring scans to check how the follicles are growing. These monitoring scans will start from day seven after you have started the injections 
which means after the first week of injections, and then happen every other day until you're ready for egg recovery, which is usually over the end of the second week of injections. During these scans, we measure the follicle growth and hope to see a steady growth over two scans. Once we are satisfied that the follicles have reached a certain size, we stop both the injections and give you a final trigger injection, which is usually administered 36 to 38 hours prior to egg recovery. It's very important to take this injection timely and correctly to avoid any problems on the day of egg recovery where we could might not get any eggs or immature eggs if this is not taken correctly. So this is the image of our day ward and that's where your egg recovery procedure will happen. This is situated on the second floor of the fertility center. On the day of the egg recovery, we'll give you an appointment time to come an hour before the procedure and also to take oral pain relief, including paracetamol and ibuprofen if you're not allergic to it. After you've arrived to the day ward, a doctor will put a little needle in your hand called the cannula through which we can give you the injections, the painkillers through your vein. We also give you an oral sedation tablet that helps you to relax before the procedure. Your partner will be required to produce sperm sample on the day unless it has been frozen before or we have donor sperm available. We ask you not to put any makeup or jewelry or any varnish or gel nails on the day. For pain relief, we give you fentanyl, which is a very potent painkiller through, through your vein. And it, once we have given you the injection, it takes maximum of five minutes for it to achieve its maximum, to achieve the highest effect. The egg recovery, therefore, is well tolerated by majority. However, minor discomfort can be expected. The procedure takes about 15-20 minutes and then you will remain on the day ward for a couple of hours. You can eat and drink straight away, provided everything is okay, and then will be allowed to go home accompanied by your friend or partner. As we have given you the oral sedation and pain relief, you're not allowed to drive for 24 hours after the procedure. This is our procedure room where you will have the egg recovery. You will have a doctor who's performing the procedure. You'll have a nurse who's looking after you and your observations and a healthcare assistant who will be helping the doctor with the procedure. You can see a green door and besides that is the lab and a little window through which we communicate with the lab team. We now have a video to show you regarding the egg recovery procedure. So if you see this image, you can see um, this is, we're looking at one of the ovaries and these dark circles which are large are the follicles or egg sacs which are ready and possibly could have an egg within. So the video is now playing. You can see a green dotted line and this is the line through it where the needle would enter and you'll see the needle entry shortly. So we have um, selected one of the follicles to which the needle would be entering. As you can see, that's there. And you'll slowly see that the needle, the follicle of the egg sac is collapsing on itself, which means we are draining the fluid through the needle from that follicle. The fluid which is, is collected in the test tube and then passed to our lab staff. 
for checking under the microscope for the presence of an egg. So you can see we are now in the second follicle. And like this, we'll go from one follicle to the next. And after completion of all the follicles, which are above a certain size from one ovary, we move to the next. So what are the treatment risks from the clinical point of view? The first risks are related to ovarian stimulation, where you could not, you might not respond as expected, which is poor ovarian response, and is classed as development of less than two follicles. If this happens, we might have to cancel your cycle. On the other hand, you might over-respond or develop more than 20 follicles. We will discuss what measures we can take to avoid this from happening. The other risks are related to the medications that we administer, where you might develop allergy if you have not had it before, or risk during the egg recovery procedure, which include infection, bleeding, or injury to blood vessels or internal organs. This, however, is very rare. Occasionally, we might fail to retrieve any eggs. Once you've had an embryo transfer done, there are risks of multiple pregnancy, and hence to minimize this, we prefer to do a single embryo transfer. You might also encounter early pregnancy problems like miscarriage or ectopic pregnancy. This brings us on to the end of the clinical part. The next is what happens in the lab after we have recovered the eggs. So to start off, this is, and you can see there are special lighting and safety cabinets. These dim yellow lights are preferable for embryo development. And you can see there are workstations and incubators on the worktops, as well as embryoscopes, which I'll be talking about later. So in the lab, one worry that's always, always remain is how do we handle your egg, sperm and embryos? And how do we ensure that wrong eggs and sperm are not mixed. To ensure this for safety of yourself and us, we have a system called the RI witnessing system in which all the dishes which will have your egg sperm are tagged and there is an electronic card assigned to you at the very start. Every time any dish containing your samples is handled, it is witnessed through this electronic card system to ensure that there is no mismatch. This therefore works as a safeguard and reassurance. There's also a system of every time the handling is done that a report can be taken or printed out to show all the steps that have been witnessed. Along with that, some of the key steps are also double witnessed where a second member of the lab staff witnesses the procedure. So during the egg recovery, as I mentioned, the tubes containing fluid and eggs are passed on to the embryologist. They look at them under the microscope to identify an egg. And not all follicles or tubes will have an egg. On average, we expect 70 to 80% of the follicles to give us an egg. However, this could be less or more. And this is how an egg looks under the microscope. That's the last image. The next step is to prepare the sperm. The sperm has to be assessed under the microscope and see the numbers which are there as well as the number which are swimming well. As you can see in the video, this is a good sperm sam sample where you've got good numbers which are swimming well. 
Once we have assessed the sperm under the microscope, there are two ways we can fertilize the eggs. The first treatment that's offered is the standard IVF technique, or it's also called as insemination, where the prepared sperm is mixed into the dish which has the egg. As you can see, this video that's playing is the egg, and you can see plenty of sperm swimming around it. One of the sperm, by the process of natural selection, as would happen in your body, would find its way into the egg. If, however, the sperm numbers are low or the sperm is not swimming well, or alternatively, we have surgically retrieved the sperm, then we offer a treatment called ICSI. For this treatment, one of the sperm that's looking healthy is selected and injected manually into the egg. So this is a video for ICSI, which illustrates this technique very clearly. Before injecting the egg, this maturity has to be established. Only the mature eggs can be injected. Now you can see in the video, the egg is being injected and the sperm is being released to ensure that it enters the egg. This process is invasive and the fertilization rates are similar to what you'll expect for IVF, which is 60 to 70%. However, in some cases, fertilization may not occur. So after IVF or ICSI, the eggs now are kept in the incubators and we have embryoscopes, which are quite advanced incubators. They're also called as time-lapse system. And what they allow is to observe how the embryos are developing. The incubator has a video camera attached and it takes images every 10 minutes. What this allows as compared to a conventional incubator is to keep the embryos in an undisturbed environment and assess them regularly to see how they are developing. It also provides more information by the way the embryos have developed to help with selecting the embryos for transfer. So this slide shows how from an fertilized egg an embryo develops. So the first image is where the egg has been fertilized and then across the series, you can see that this one fertilized egg is dividing into two, four, eight, and then finally into a ball of cells, which reorganizes itself into two cell groups. From this stage to the final image, we reach what's called the blastocyst. Not all embryos, however, would be equal and they can vary at different stages of development. Now, there are a couple of videos to show the difference in the development between a poor and a good embryo. So you can see two videos playing side by side. The one on the left shows an embryo that's not developing so well here you can see that it's difficult to see the number of cells because it's divided so irregularly. Whereas the video on the right, you can see that it's clearly dividing into equal round cells. And at the end, you can tell that there are about eight cells in it, which are more or less regular. So therefore, this embryo, the one on the right, will get a good grading compared to the one on the left. This shows the embryo development on day five. So the one on the left again is a poorer embryo, 
which as you can see is dividing quite unequally, whereas wood embryo, where you can see the cells are equal, they then go on to develop into a ball of cells. And finally, you can see that in the circle, they're arranged into two cell groups. One of the cell group is in the outer side, and this is the one which forms the placenta. And there is a group of cells in the inner side. So this is called the inner cell mass, and this is the one which gives rise to the baby later. So this slide talks about when we transfer the embryos. So this depends upon how many embryos we have, what stages they are, and what grades they get. So the transfer can happen on day two, three, or five. On average, 50% of eggs will reach good quality embryos on day three, and out of those, further 50% will reach the blastocyst stage. Our center policy promotes a single embryo transfer to minimize the risk of multiple pregnancy. So once the embryos are ready and we have selected one for transfer, the best quality one is transferred into your womb. During this procedure, it's very simple. An ultrasound scan is done through your abdomen and with the help of a fine plastic catheter, the embryo is deposited into the womb. The ultrasound helps us to see that we are depositing the embryos at the right place. Following the transfer, any additional embryos which are good and suitable for freezing are vitrified. This technique involves storing the embryos in liquid nitrogen. All the embryos are vitrified and labeled in color-coded straws, and they can be kept frozen for up to 10 years. The tanks in which the embryos remain frozen are controlled by a 24-hour alarm system, and a mobile is manned by an embryologist who receives a call if any thing unexpected or any alarms happen. Only the good quality embryos can be vitrified and we cannot achieve freezing in all cycles. On average, about 50% of couples could have freezing of at least one additional embryo from their treatment cycle. When it comes to using these frozen embryos, it is a simple procedure and the embryos can be defrosted either on the day or the day before embryo transfer. Not all embryos will survive this thaw process, but on average, 80 to 90% will do. The embryologists call you on the day before the transfer and discuss the number of embryos thought to be thought with you. Following embryo transfer, we ask you to take progesterone pessaries as we have suppressed your own hormones. These are vaginal pessaries which are taken twice a day. After 15 days, you have to take a pregnancy test to see whether it's positive or negative. It's important that you contact us with the result. This is because we are regulated by HFEA, who is our regulating authority, and all treatment results have to be submitted to the HFEA as per our licensing guidelines within five days. If your test is positive, we'll arrange a pregnancy scan appointment for you around seven weeks. However, if the cycle is not successful, then your notes are reviewed and you will be offered a consultation appointment with a doctor or nursing staff. So this finishes the clinical and lab aspects of treatment. The next part that I'm going to talk you through are the lifestyle considerations and some questions which arise frequently. Lifestyle is a very important aspect of treatment 
and something that can influence the outcomes of treatment. And hence, it's very important that you do follow the, this the best you can. Currently, you know about the coronavirus pandemic, as well as we have Zika and Ebola virus risks. So it's important to review your travel plan plans and avoid traveling if it's not essential. For Zika virus risks, there are countries if they're affected by Zika virus and you have visited them, you, we cannot proceed with fertility treatment for at least two months for women and three months for men. It's important that you have a healthy weight prior to entering into treatment and take a balanced diet with moderate exercise and reduce your alcohol intake and avoid alcohol during treatment. For ladies, we'll ask all of you to take folic acid and vitamin D supplementation, which then continues for the first trimester of pregnancy. So the questions that are asked commonly is when to take your injections. We advise preferably in the evening. The second question is comes from men who ask us about using antioxidant supplements to, to improve their sperm quality. This again has uh, many studies have not shown any additional benefits from it. Another question is about fluid intake which we ask you to increase and also reduce caffeine due to avoid to avoid dehydration effect. During treatment, you can experience increased tiredness. However, there's no reason to stop working and we can be flexible with the scan appointments as far as possible. We also advise you to carry on with moderate exercise and just do it as per your comfort level. Currently, there are certain specific requirements related to travel and COVID-19. Now, for traveling due to coronavirus, we, most of the appointments will be remote. However, when you come for scans and procedures to center, um, only the lady, ladies would be advised to attend on their own. And on the day prior to attending, the nursing staff will go through the triage questionnaire with you to ask for any symptoms or any risks for COVID. If we do find any risks that your treatment might be canceled at that point. If everything is okay and you are proceeding, you will need a few visits to the clinic. The initial one will be for your baseline scan. Then you'll need three to four visits on alternate days for your monitoring scans one visit for egg recovery and embryo transfer, and then the final visit for a pregnancy scan. So what are the clinic appointments entail? So prior to appointment, we will send you information regarding coronavirus and also a consent form, <coughs> excuse me, which gives you the option of differing treatment. Once you return the consents back to us, we will arrange a consultation appointment for you. These will be video consultations with the doctor and nurse. And during these consultations, we will assess your medical lifestyle history. If you're coming face to face, an ultrasound scan might be done. All your treatment consent forms will be discussed, witnessed and signed. And we'll discuss your individualized treatment plan with you. For ovarian stimulation, one size does not fit all, and we will prescribe you the medication based on your age, background history, and investigation results, which have been done so far. As a part of treatment, uh, some consents that you have to sign, and you also need to know about our regulating authority, which is the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. HFEA regulates all the clinics who provide licensed fertility treatment across UK. They keep account of all treatments and provide important information to public and professionals. The website address is here and you might find useful information for yourself. 
the consent forms that we'll ask you to sign are um, include the HFEA consents, which are CD, FW, T, and MT, as well as our local consents related to storage, treatment, and costed plan for those who are self-funding their treatment cycle. The first HFEA form is CD, and this asks your permission to share the information with GP, other healthcare professionals, and audit admin staff. We need your permission for all three to carry on with our business purposes normally. This form also asks you about participation in research, which is a project through clinic in future, or non-contact research, which is for any researcher who has appropriate permission to have your anonymized information for research purposes. It's important that you check that both of you agree, have uh, the same agree or agreement on the answers that you've given to the research sections. The WT and MT forms are related to creation of embryos and storage and the duration that you want the embryos to be stored for. It also asks you questions of giving us instructions of what's to be done in case of the unfortunate event of your death or mental incapacity. The forms are quite self-explanatory, and but if you have any queries, you can discuss it with the clinic staff. Legally, you're allowed to freeze your embryos for 10 years, and in some cases, like those who are having Cancer treatment could extend their storage for up to 55 years, but this is not for all the couples. According to our center policy, we have a local contract for storing embryos, and those who are self-funding the storage have to keep their payments up to date for the storage to continue. Finally, we get on to some useful information. And this, the first slide is about our success rates. So in this slide, we have presented our life birth rates from fresh treatment cycle over the last four years and have compared it to the national average. So the results are from 2016 to 2019. And these are colored, coordinated in different um, no bars and the light blue crosses are the national average rates which are published by the HFEA. So as you can see are when you divide the results into age groups, the younger age groups have better chance of success. And if you look at our treatment results overall, they compare well with the national average. The second slide is for um, the light birth rates from our frozen embryo transfer cycles. And this again is divided into the age group categories over the last four years. The comparison is made with the national average. And again, our results are satisfactory. This slide presents the treatment success rates from egg and sperm recipient treatment cycle, which means the cycles where treatment has happened using donor eggs and donor sperm. The average success rates with donor eggs is around 48% for fresh cycles and 46% for frozen cycles. Whereas the average success rates with sperm recipient treatment cycle is around 24% in the age group 35 to 37 years. These are our own center results over the last year. Our center also promotes um, the policy of single embryo transfer, as I've mentioned before, and this is uh, called one at a time. 
and endorses the statement that the aim of all fertility treatment is to provide comprehensive support and the birth of a healthy singleton child who is born at full term. This is to ensure that fertility treatment is safe for you and the baby. Fertility treatment can become overwhelming at times and therefore we have some support services available. This includes independent counselor. This is a fully confidential service and we can offer video based appointments on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Friday. You can contact us through this email address to arrange the appointments. Another useful website is Fertility Network Scotland, which provides plenty of resources for support. We also have a local miscarriage support group and the website info is as stated here. One thing that's not on the slide is a support through our emergency mobile. And this is for any emergencies or urgent queries that you might have out of ours, which is beyond four o'clock in the day until eight o'clock next morning when the center opens again. The mobile is carried by one of the doctors and they will advise you, your, advise you as necessary about any of the queries that you might have. That brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry that there are no opportunity to ask questions on this web-based presentation. However, please note down your queries and bring it to the clinic. When you come, our staff will be happy to help you as best possible. I wish you all the best for your treatment and hope to see you soon.